<laughs> uh, also, well, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā koutou katoa, ko Jay tuko ingoa, ko tanga tatariti aho. It's so wonderful to see so many friendly and familiar faces in the Zoom room and to new ones that are also interested in this specific topic around design, tech and innovation for better futures. Um, we'll start with a karakia and then we'll jump into uh, diving into the space around this uh, courageous conversation and the court at all as well. Uh, and if you know this, feel free to join in. Me karakia tato. Ko te kawa o runga, ko te kawa o raro, ko te kawa ora, ko te kawa ora, e rongo e whakaere hia ki runga, turu turu o whiti whakamo ki a tēnā, tēnā, huie, taikie. Wonderful, no mai haere mai and welcome to Academy EX. This is um, part of a uh, tech and innovation panel discussion. Uh, and we had one earlier this year around climate tech and innovation, uh, last year around Web3 tech and innovation for better futures, and then coming up health tech and innovation for better futures as well. But just really want to start by acknowledging mana whenua from the lands in which we're zooming in from, Ngāti Whātua Ōrake. want to acknowledge Tangata Whenua as our first storytellers, as designers and innovators um, of Aotearoa New Zealand. Want to acknowledge the amazing leaders, designers, innovators that are in the Zoom room and our incredible panelists that are here to share their wonderful words of wisdom and their amazing mahi with you as well. Um, but for those that haven't been to Academy EX um, session or event, online event or offline event, I thought I'd play this little video um, which kind of captures the essence um, and, little, and tells you a little bit more about Academy EX. At Academy EX, we are here on a mission to create impactful futures for as many people as we can and change lives for the better. As a future-focused, human-centric organisation, we recognise the need to change and adapt to meet the needs of contemporary learners and the future of our planet. We challenge the status quo and provide innovative postgraduate qualifications and programmes accredited by the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. As our learners have grown, so too have we. We started in 2013 aspiring to upskill the educational workforce through the Mind Lab. We then created Tech Futures Lab in 2016 to navigate some of the world's most disruptive technologies. Then we launched Earth Futures Lab to shine a light on what we need to know to protect our environment and our future. Across our faculties, the Mind Lab, Tech Futures Lab and Earth Futures Lab, anyone from around the world can build essential skills and rise to the opportunities of today and tomorrow. We have the perfect trio of interconnected faculties developed for busy professionals who want to stay informed, engaged and connected. We can bring more learning excellence to deliver future-focused learning solutions to the businesses here and around the world because new knowledge and skills can move entire industries forward to the future. Academy EX is here to deliver the best-in-class education experience to bring fresh, innovative learning to anyone to create impactful futures. Amazing. So, whoop, thanks guys. So, um, that is Academy EX, but what you're probably curious about what's actually happening today. So we start off with the karakia, a bit of a welcome. If you haven't had a chance to, please pop your intro in the chat. So your name, your location, and one thing you're curious about learning today. We'll introduce our panel speakers and hear from the wonderful Alice, John, and Victoria. And then we'll jump into the panel discussion um, and hear some guiding questions to start us off with. If you have any comments, reflections, or questions, feel free to pop, pop it in the chat as well. We um, Jaina will be amazing at keeping an eye on it. I will try and focus on keeping on the slides. Um, and then if you're keen to get in touch or um, have any other questions, we'll stay around for a little bit longer, but we're hoping to close for the karakia by 5.30 at the latest as well. So, and how is the Zoom session going to work? Those that, um, I see some friendly, familiar faces, but those that haven't joined us before, the session will be recorded. 
and sent out via email tomorrow, along with the slide deck and upcoming learning opportunities. We often use Otter AI to capture the notes in the background, um, and then we'll kind of recap with an insights blog and share that with you and the wider Academy EX community in a few weeks' time. Um, please keep yourself on mute unless you're asking questions towards the end. Please use the chat function, pop your comments in, um, and we will have, you know, focused Q&A time at the end as well. And if you feel comfortable too, we love to see your smiling faces as well. Uh, so please turn your video on. But enough around the formalities. Uh, really excited to introduce you to our incredible speakers uh, around the uh, design tech and innovation for better futures panel discussion. So first up, we have the a wonderful Alice Diamond. Alice and I actually had have the privilege and pleasure of studying alongside a systems sanctuary or systems thinking masterclass together. Um, that she is incredible human um, and design and social innovation lead at Tōkana Teraki, the Māori future makers, and you'll hear a bit more about the amazing mahi that they're doing uh, very shortly. Then you have John Lee, who is a fellow, um, EHF fellow as well, and I think we've got a few EHFers in the community here, and previously um, lead head up, head, head it up, is that a word? <laughs> Generative AI at Meta as well. Um, and is in, involved in lots of amazing kind of interesting ventures, which you'll hear about shortly. And then Victoria Mulligan, who is an amazing consultant, management consultant at X is Y, um, focused on ways of working and ways of being, but also the co-founder of Design Futures chapter that was newly launched um, last week at Academy EX in person, in real life. So we do do also in real life events as well. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to Alice and just let me know when you want me to, you know, move the slides forward. Goodbye. Well, um, tēnā tātou, nā waka huri noi te motu nai a te reo o tahu e mihi kawana kia koutou, uh, ko wai tēnei he uri he mokapuna tēnei o kaitahu kāti mamoi wai taha minati kahanunu, uh, ko taku Taha uri tārewa no awarua o kutipuna ko taku taha ukaipo he pākea no ingarangi. Uh, I whānau mai au ki, ki o tautahi, i tipuaki au ki o tautahi, kei o tautahi tonu au i tēnei wā uh, ko Alice Diamond tōku ingoa. Uh, kia ora koutou, thank you so much for having me and um, just for those who um, wanted to know more about my whakapapa, I am from um, Kaitahu, Kāti Mamoi Waitaha in the south, and my whakapapa draws me down to the very bottom of the south, which is Bluff, but I have not spent much time there, and I have spent majority of my life in uh, Christchurch. I, if we probably can flick to the next slide, um, I currently work for an organisation called Tokuna Saraki, which um, we call ourselves Māori Future Makers, and that was just kind of my little Nice uh, slide there with our logo, but if you want to flick right on through to the next slide, Jade, thank you. Um, so who are we? We are a social innovation agency that um, is set up to try to tackle the inequities that Māori face um, at their root causes and work out the, the changes that are going to make the biggest difference. My role at Tokuna Taraki is um, a project manager, which just um, means that I look after um, projects and the rangatahi who work within those projects and I've been at Tokuna for about a year and a half but in terms of a bit about my background um, my journey into this sort of work uh, started with uh, an undergraduate degree in, in sociology which was really just because I um, felt like something needed to change and, and wanted to do something that kind of taught me about those um, those uh, systemic or inherent um, inequalities within our system and that's where I really started to learn about this concept of social inequity and systemic inequity and that's um, I came back to so that was in Dunedin came back to Christchurch worked for my iwi and Ngaitahu and I worked running programs that were helping our people and were helping um, to give people a really great experience but what I was seeing was that it wasn't really addressing those deep root systems that were still kind of holding inequity in place um, so I 
wanted to kind of move into that I ended up doing a master's that um, I explored how innovation and technology can be used to kind of unweave some of these systemic issues and then uh, managed to find my way back to Tokumatsuraki which um, I'm really honoured and pleased to be able to work for an organisation that is still working on behalf of my iwi and on behalf of my people um, but is doing exactly what I want to be doing which is unweaving the kind of current broken systems and trying to reweave new new systems that work for Māori. So our goal at Tokuna Saraki, if you flick through Jade, our goal is equity and employment education and income for Māori by 2040 and we do that through trying to identify and counter the causes of inequity whilst simultaneously creating new and um, better equitable systems. And we are always thinking about how we shift equity from being just an, an aspiration to being an action. And we do that, Jade, if you flick through, by um, working. So we work with and from our Matauraka Māori, so our Indigenous knowledge systems, which really just means that we trust in ourselves and trust in our knowledge systems and understanding of the world to guide how we innovate and how we uh, create and collaborate with others. And we believe in creating solutions for the future with the future at the forefront. So we have a huge focus on um, training and capability building within our organization, which really just means we employ young people and work with young people um, a lot and are trying to build that next generation of um, Māori future makers. And we do our work both internally and externally. So we are often um, working with our iwi. So looking at how we can build whānau, hapu and iwi capability to create um, mana motu haki solutions, advance ngaitahu aspirations. But then we also work with um, great organisations out in the world and, and tangata tiriti organisations to develop and implement systems change projects. And the next slide, so I put this slide in here because I wanted to um, to kind of intro where we are now and why we're here. And I, and I wanted to use the word design because I intentionally wanted to um, talk about where, we're, where we are right now as, as being that we have designed a, a system that isn't um, working for Māori. So we often think about design as being um, kind of a field of work or a discipline, but at its core, design is really just, it just means that something has been created with, in, with um, intention. And as you can see, very soon after the signing of, of Te Tiriti or Waitangi, our education system was being used intentionally to push Māori into low-skilled, low-paid work. Um, and then that thinking of the past kind of lives on now in the in the mindsets and the practices and the policies of today, which means that Māori are still overrepresented in low paid, low skilled work um, and then suffer all the negative consequences that come with that um, in, in terms of poorer outcomes and hit first, hardest and longest every time we have any sort of economic shock. So there's, I think, power in knowing that it was done intentionally because if it was designed intentionally, then we can um, we can redesign it. So that's where we come in. So we are trying to, if you flick through, Jade, we are looking at how to uh, reweave a new system um, that has Māori as part of the fabric. So these tukutuku panels, what we were trying to show here is, is currently our world is, or Aotearoa is set up um, and woven with a pattern of inequity. And, and often we see these kind of programmatic interventions that trying to unpack or unweave a little piece of that system. But what we think needs to happen is that we need to look at it at a really macro level and reweave a whole new system that works with for Māori and it's not just kind of tacked on to the side. Part of the way that we do that is um, through uh, our kawa for Māori future making, which is called Te Kore Koreka. And if you can flick through, Jade. So Te Kore Koreka is our kawa for Māori future making, which just means it's a process or practice guide or methodology, and, and it guides the way that we do our work. And it's also grounded in our Māori knowledge systems. So 
to create Te Kore Koreka, we looked to the way that our tupuna, our ancestors, understood creation and um, wanted to use that to create this kind of framework to guide the way that we worked. And as you can see, it's cyclical. So while um, Western ways of thinking sees the world as being often like a big bang, so there was something and it's quite linear, uh, a Māori way of seeing the world is that we go through these cycles. And as we cycle through, we are moving through different realms or different worlds. So we created um, Te Kore Kore drawing on those kind of Māori knowledge systems, but also drawing from a karakia of one of our tohunga um, in Ngaitahu, um, Māti Ahatira Morehu. And in that karakia, um, he speaks of four different realms of um, creation. And they are Te Aoturua, Te Kore, Te Pō, and Te Aomarama. And our, our intention in creating Te Kore Kore was really just to provide people with a new way to work um, effectively and creatively together. And we believe that it is only going to be that through using more um, or using Indigenous knowledge systems are we going to be able to create uniquely Indigenous solutions and if we keep using Western frameworks, then we're probably going to end up recreating systems that don't work for Indigenous or minority people. So Te Kore Kore Ka is really just our way of imagining, imagining and navigating towards a better future. Um, and we have put it out in the world available for other people to use. So I have on the next slide, I think, chucked a QR code and a um, web address there. If you do want to interact with Te Kore Kore Ka, it is on our website. Um, but yeah, that's just a little bit about um, our mahi and what I do at Tokuna and some of our the way that we like to do it. And I think I am passing straight to John now. Thanks, Alice. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm John. Uh, I currently live in Seattle and um, have this connection with New Zealand as a EHF fellow. Um, my origin story. And my connection to New Zealand started in 2016 when uh, my wife and I backpacked through New Zealand and did a bunch of the great walks. Uh, I remember getting off the plane and stepping out onto Christchurch, and that was my first time in New Zealand, and absolutely fell in love. I was and within the first 10 minutes was ready to move to New Zealand. And now uh, I'm on this journey of um being a founder and trying to create uh, some adventure products for kids um, and innovate uh, through material science. Um, previously, I uh, worked at, on Gen AI at Meta for our reality labs. Uh, Jade, if you could go on next slide. Uh, I was heading up some of the designs for our Ray-Ban Stories collaboration. Uh, it's essentially sunglasses that have a camera and microphone and allows you to be hands-free and really capture media and be really present in the moment. And there was just uh, a variety of ways we approached this design. And originally I started out doing AR and VR and focusing on the privacy side of things. And what that experience did for me was really give me insight into how we collect data. And after talking to a lot of people throughout the world, um, really understanding what the core uh, concerns people had with having cameras and microphones. Um, Facebook has a variety of hardware devices, um, some that haven't been released yet. And that mixed with um, a negative press cycle, in addition to uh, advanced AR and VR camera technology, we, we really had to take an approach in understanding how to deal with people's concerns, um, set, up, set us up for strong product design, and figure out how to solve uh, some problems that people had, uh, and figure out a way to have compelling solutions as people kind of go through their lives. And so we partnered with Ray-Ban to create some lifestyle products. And um, that Ray-Ban Stories uh, device is one of the key um, 
first steps for Facebook to kind of lead in kind of uh, the device plus gen AI space in terms of processing large amounts of information from text to speech or speech to text. And it's just a fascinating environment, especially on this topic of design tech and innovation, overlapping with human needs and human uh, potential. And so um, just really keen on talking to everyone here and learning from everyone here as well um, to just have an open conversation about design tech and innovation. Um, currently, I um, said previously that I'm trying to create some adventure products for kids. Um, take, I've taken a pretty big step away from um, tech and really want to focus on kids and adventure. Um, really, really at a fundamental level, believe that good adventures make good people. And so my next venture now is to really invest in, in that whole problem space. So i um, excited to be here and uh, I'll pass it over to Victoria. Well, thanks, John. It's a very difficult X to follow. Um, kia ora koutou, ko Victoria, toko ingoa. Um, I won't go through an intro of myself. I think Jade did a very good job of that. But what um, I will say is that I have four children at home, all of whom are varying levels of sickness at the moment. And my four-year-old is want to come into the room. He, he does like to do that. So I just wanted to, at the outset, say, if that happens, if he floats in, be cool, be kind, it'll pass. Um, but I'm used to it and we'll just keep calm and carry on. Anyway, um, so I am involved in a few different projects at the moment, primarily in the future space. Um, I'm a bit of a, a magpie like that, um, but today I have chosen to talk to you um, briefly, good luck to us, um, about a project that I'm involved with that is um, a network mapping project looking at the network of futures practitioners currently practicing in New Zealand. Um, and it, and it's, 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 a new, it's a new way of working, it's a new way of thinking, and I'm, I'm super excited to be about it. So I, I like to start by saying, you know, if you think about networks, what we generally find is that people's brains just jump to the digital space or contacts in your phone or um, painful networking events that we've had to survive through. But networks are, are so much broader um, and way more pervasive than I think most people realize from neural networks that spark ideas in our brains. I know we've got lots of designers in the, in the Zoom room to technological networks that are making up the internet, mycelial networks. They're really key to how we interact with the world. Um, so at its core, um, I like to think about a network as a sort of web of relationships that connect people and things. And that idea of connection is super simple, but the potential that those connections offer is really huge. Um, so most of us are well acquainted with social networks, online and in person, often too well acquainted. Um, but there is real transformative power, in my opinion, in the sort of deliberate, intentional organization of networks. Um, they don't just have to be about connections, and I think that's the magic about them. Um, we shape them as really powerful spaces for learning, sharing, collaboration. Um, and I, I think this is particularly important when we're trying to deal with pressing and complex issues like we are at the minute. So when networks start to turn their attention to social or environmental challenges, they transform into what we call impact networks. And that's the space that um, I'm sort of leaning into at the moment. It's not about who you know, but what you can achieve together. Um, and it's that sense of, I guess, a shared purpose that sets them apart and helps us work beyond like the typical barriers that we are confined around regions and organizations and silos. So the definition that I work off is that an impact network um, is something that brings um, individuals and organizations together for learning and collaborative action toward a shared purpose. And that shared purpose um, is really key. Um, there is a guy called David Ehrlichman who is an amazing leader in the space, he actually breaks it down even further and I'm not gonna get into that, but he talks about learning networks that foster co-creation of knowledge action networks that drive outcomes and movement networks that um, mobilize people around shared vision. Um, so I wanted to introduce that, um, that concept of impact mapping, impact networks. I wanted to give you that bit of theory because I think it helps um, when I talk about what we're doing now, which is actually mapping that impact space around futures in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand at the moment. Um, so, oh, Jade, you're on slides. 
you wouldn't mind jumping through for me, that would be it. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so um, the Aotearoa Futures Network map um, was born out of um, some discussions I had when I was down in Otatahi Christchurch, um, actually with Alice and a group of others, and talking to people that were working in futures in New Zealand around um, what they were experiencing, what they felt um, they, they needed, what might be missing. Um, and we started to go through a discovery process of understanding yeah, what what their experience was. So, as a as a sort of bit of insight into that, what we heard was that they wanted to find a way to build a community of practice. Um, people were looking for ways to be able to accelerate shared learnings, um, to reduce duplication of effort. If you can understand what everybody is doing in various spaces, you're not reinventing a wheel. To make sure that diverse voices were included, to break down silos, um, and also super importantly was to to increase collective impact of the work that they were doing, because certainly here across across the country, there is amazing work being done um, in futures everywhere um, in trying to understand who's doing it, why they're doing it, what they're finding um, is, is a really valuable um, space to be in. So um, based, on, based on what we learned, what we heard, um, we broke that down into four key project goals. So we wanted to find a way to be able to map the space, to understand what it looked like, the actors involved. Um, we wanted to find a way to be able to connect the people that were involved and not otherwise connected if they wanted to be connected. Um, we wanted to find a way that we might be able to support actors in the network. And lastly, a way to amplify those efforts. Um, because like I said, the work that's being done is amazing. How do we lift that up and how do we learn from that? And then to give a to give a bit more detail to those goals, I, I want to start by saying that the, our fundamental goal, our sort of North Star, was to be able to foster the sense of purpose and collective action among those who are working to shape a more just, equal and sustainable Aotearoa for future generations. We use that as our North Star. But the objectives in a more detailed sense were to build and visualise a community of practice. Um, and we're doing that, we'll get to that in a minute, but the visualisation of it actually was really important um, so that it wasn't something that would be um, documented in a, in a paper, in a report and sit on the shelf gathering dust, but it was something that people could see, they could touch, they could interact with. Um, we wanted to find a way to be able to, again, accelerate that shared learning um, and innovation among the practitioners and do that in a way that was varied. So. Um, using online platforms, um, activities, projects, events. So Jade mentioned we had our first um, in-person meetup for one of the um, sort of areas of work, one of the chapters we're calling them in, in Aotearoa, um, and to increase the collective impact um, and visibility of futures work here by developing a common framework, a language and an advocacy strategy. So being really clear, giving some clarity, giving some transparency to the work that people are doing, speaking the same language, um, understanding what it is that we're working toward um, and then to understand the current state and dynamics of the futures ecosystem so identifying strengths potential gaps exploring opportunities for collaboration and impact and that's really important because if you can see a space and you can explore a space you can see where there is um, I guess pockets that you can start to leverage where things are going really well or areas that there might be work missing or that could be improved upon or expanded or learned from. Um, so to go through that process, um, we did sort of snowball sampling. So we had quite a small sample of people who self-identified as futures practitioners in that first instance. And then we asked them to add to it. So we, we basically asked, who else is there um, working in the space at the minute that you would suggest that we um, go to and ask if they would like to be included in a map like this? Um, and I get asked this quite a bit, so I put it on the slide. So what did we consider as somebody who was um, practicing in the future space? We kept it as broad as we could. Um, it is self-identified as working in the future space, but we use the APF definition, which is someone who uses foresight methods and tools to help clients or employers explore alternative futures and their implications for present day action. So we had that initial opt-in saying, yep, I work in the future space. I would like to be included in the map. 
And then we moved on to phase two of the project, which we are um, in the thick of at the moment, where a survey has gone out to people who have self-identified to ask them about their levels of connection and their levels of collaboration with others that have been identified on the map. And so they, I think that's where the magic starts to happen really with um, network maps. It's one thing to be able to identify actors that are working in the space, but more important um, than that is understanding how they're connected and how they're collaborating. And so that is what we are intending to do with the map. Um, those responses are due back, I think actually to complete this week. Um, and they will be being mapped onto a platform called Kumu. Um, again, it's a lovely interactive map um, that enables you to, to zoom into the map to look at who's working in the space, from what organisation, what are the areas that they, they might be leaning into, um, filter by geography, that sort of thing as well. So again, it's giving people sort of the agency to be able to um, jump into a space, explore the space, understand the space and figure out um, how they can use and, and and I guess leverage from learnings on that. Um, so one of the one of the I guess practicals that came out of this process was that there were definite um, areas or uh, communities of practice across Aotearoa that were doing um, really wonderful things. And as I said, the sort of the, the impetus for this came from being a part of the Otatahi Futures Collective. Um, and so we looked around at what was available um, in the rest of the country and felt like something was missing. So we were missing something that was um, in Auckland as an opportunity for people to come together and speculate about the future, to design for preferred futures, for better futures. Um, and we went to the Design Futures Initiative, which is a global organisation that has chapters all around the world. And we put in an application for Tamaki Makoto um, and it was put through. Um, and so for this chapter, um, we, I'm uh, oh, sorry, the, the DFI chapter, so the um, global initiative aims to connect um, a really diverse group of people from designers to strategists, engineers, scientists, artists, futurists um, from all around the world. Um, they aim to um, support people to be able to collaborate, to work together, to connect um, in ways and means across different platforms. So again, you can see the connection back to that network mapping where people were asking for these communities of practice, um, asking to be connected to people, asking to learn from one another. And this chapter, particularly in Tamaki Makoto, really filled that gap. Um, yep, okay, that one's pretty clear. So we had um, we had our first chapter, our first in-person meetup um, last week, actually at Academy EX. Um, and the, the big takeaway from that was, uh, I think, the real desire for it. So we actually um, sold out for our, our first event and we, we actually marketed it as a almost like a pre-launch um, because what we did is we took our, um, almost like our purpose statement about what the chapter was set up to do to the wider group. So we could say, have we got this right? Is this what we need? Is this what we care about? Um, are these the values that we want guiding the way that we work? Um, and we used um, that, that forum, that um, opportunity to ask those questions and to get feedback um, on, on how to, I guess, progress with the chapter and the initiative. Um, and so that is where we find ourselves now. Um, shall I pass back to you, Jade, to, to carry us on? Yes, sounds good. Oh, kia ora. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria, John and Alice. So many Wonderful um, golden nuggets and words of wisdom. I really love the impact networks around the futures map and obviously such a privilege to be able to collaborate on that with you, Victoria, and a few others as well. John, the progression from VR, AI, Gen AI, and, you know, like big tech products to now like little humans, little um, kid products is really wonderful and fasc fascinating and really love to delve into that and really love the um, quote that you mentioned, Alice, around how we need to kind of move forward around designing intentionally. If we designed intentionally, then we can redesign it. And how do you reweave a whole new system um, to create better futures as well? So leads us into our first question. And if you have any comments or reflections or questions, feel free again, pop it in the chat. Um, and I'm, you know, whoever would like to answer this first, feel free to. But why is the intersection of design tech and innovation for better futures important to you? And why were you drawn to this work in the first place? 
So um, whoever would like to answer, how to Vic, John or Alice, feel free to unmute and go for gold. I can jump in then. You're going to be so close oh, yes. in a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess for, for me, I think that um, we live in this increasingly complex society and the issues that we are dealing with are increasingly complex. And so there is this massive need to be able to form and grow and work in new ways. It's just, it's critical if we want any sort of positive outcome. So I guess, I guess short version is that to address systemic issues, we have to work systemically. Um, for me, you know, talking about networks, it means that we have to work across organizations and across sectors, but also across fields of expertise like design, like technology and like innovation, because there's actually no single organization, actor, institution that can do it by themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think design is really well placed to be able to um, take that, I guess, humanity centered approach, but also a, a future centered approach to that. Beautiful. Victoria. Do you want to know Alice? Anything? Oh, Alice, if I need to. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I find this question interesting because I think, obviously, to ask about an intersection between something is to to suggest there's a distinction. And, and mm. in some ways, that makes sense because I think that from like a purely theoretical or cognitive way to th think about these things then obviously that's a great way to um they all offer different ways to think about things or define things but I think what probably for all of you what you probably find from a more practical perspective is that that distinction between design tech and innovation is is blurrier and and it's not necessarily clear all the time if you're designing or if you're innovating and I think um at Tokuna, we've tried to kind of um, deal with that complexity by just calling ourselves future makers. And, and so we don't necessarily see ourselves as being designers or technologists or social innovators, or maybe we're all three. And, and that's also where Te Kori Korika comes in, because a lot of the time, people who work in this sort of space, they're like, oh, okay, I get it. It's a co-design framework, or, or I get it. It's a futures framework, or it's a collaborations framework. And and again, it, it, it's all of those, and therefore, I guess um, when I when I read this question, Jade, I was I was like, oh, that's that's kind of I think where Tikori Korika exists. It, it exists at that intersection because it's about giving um, people a way to collaborate, people a way to convene, people a way to think about the future, um, people a way to deal with totality partnership so it, it's kind of all of those things and it is the intersection and in some in some ways that can be hard for people because it means that they because especially I think from those of us who have been well studied in the area that we, we want to compartmentalize and put it into a design box but I think that's in, in many ways the the kind of beauty of Te Kori Korika is that it can do all of those things for us and I think in terms of um, why I'm drawn to that sort of work is, is a, to me, it sort of just makes sense that we that we continue to try to better the way that we're doing things and therefore that we continue to look at the way we're doing things and adapt and innovate on that. Beautiful. Thank you, Alice. John, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I um really love this question. I, I'm I'm really drawn to the intersection of design tech and innovation just, just because as a product designer, um, we're really wired to solve problems. There's a lot of really mm -hmm. interesting and fascinating problems going on right now. And within that statement, I think it's really about not only solving those problems, but crafting really strong and beautiful stories. And that also comes together with how a designer um, and designers working with other people pull in their own stories to then mix it all together to output um, in this journey of solving problems and telling stories to, to really bring people together. Um, and within the context of, just to give an example, 
uh, those Ray-Ban stories, when I first um, started to, to design and work on it, I, I was pretty doubtful uh, of, of the product, but I think where design tech and innovation really shined for me um, was when I was able to film uh, my two-year-old running around um, while just wearing sunglasses and speaking to it without having to pull out my phone and having my son freeze up by pointing a, a camera at him. And so I, I had this very candid uh, experience with him because of how- What's going on here? Um, tech shrunk and was able to be in my sunglasses and I was able to speak to it. Um, and where the design element comes in is then what happens um, afterwards what can I do with that um, special moment that I captured with my son? And I'm just really fascinated with these uh, very personal moments where design tech and innovation could come together and try to solve some good problems. Yeah, I love that story about anchoring it around, yeah, the personal heartfelt story and those personal moments as well. Sometimes design tech and innovation feels quite unwieldy quite big can be quite overwhelming um and kind of reminding ourselves around the humanity behind why we do what we do and why you're drawn to this work too so thank you so much for sharing um kind of move us on to the next question around where i mean there are quite a few and um victoria touched on this as well around addressing systemic issues and um, we need to work in a systemic way there are big challenges that we're facing, whether it be the climate crisis, the, I don't know, political crisis, the, the poly crisis, they're calling about it, like crisis of crises. Anyway, um, globally, uh, where, you know, where do you see the current challenges of design, tech and innovation and where are the big opportunities as well? Um, whether it be in generative AI, whether it be in, I don't know, um, future making and imagining with it be in something a bit more personal. So whoever would like to share first. I feel like I'm just gonna keep jumping in. Um, Perfect. There's, there's so many challenges and there's so many opportunities, right? Um, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I've talked a bit about networks and I'll always come back to the importance of networks, but um, I wanna talk a little bit about design futures because I think that's a really interesting space at the moment. Um, I think, I think at a population level, we're, we're not very good at thinking long-term and that um, long-term about the future and that our capacity to shape it is quite imbalanced. So I think our current way of thinking about the future and our capacity to do anything about it is dominated by people in big tech or large businesses or even academia or consultancies or government foresights, foresight teams. Um, and to unblock that decision making on on complex things, on complex challenges, we need to make sure that the benefits of emerging tech are spread more widely um, if we're going to be able to get that balance back in check. So that's something that's constantly on my mind, really. How do you how do you democratize the future? How do you have people, mm. you know, designing something, imagining something? And that that's I think where we're missing a lot at the moment. We can only design what we can imagine. And there's more and more people talking about this crisis of imagination that exists at the minute, but we actually have the, the tools and the methods to you know, bring that back into check. But it's just not, you know, it's not widely known, it's not broadly shared. Um, and again, look at me coming back into networks. And I, I, I do feel that if we start to build communities of practice and if we start to build networks around the way that we think about the future, you are democratizing that and you're putting those skills to design a future into the hands of people that you know can design a better future rather than just a, an elite few. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks for sharing that, Victoria. Really love that shift around, you know, humans are wired for, or so far, some humans are wired for more short-term thinking. We think about the business world as well. It's like quarterly financial cycles. We've got annual reports in the not-for-profit world. We've got three-year political cycles. But from my understanding, Kaitahu have a 500-year plan. And Alice, I don't know if you want to 
talk speak to that or 500 years is a little bit too long it's okay. but we're doing a, a, a project looking at 2050 at the moment um which I can I can speak to um but I think I think where I was thinking about this is in terms of what the opportunity is I I really think from like a, a a personal at a personal level and I guess the work that I do I'm I'm just excited about the opportunity to continue to build the capability of our people to to use design and tech and innovation and I like what you were saying Victoria about how it isn't widely known and and therefore that's there's all I see is opportunity there because it means that we can um start to use some of these things to solve the problems of our the challenges of our communities and and then the challenges of our world um and there's a saying in serio which is kahuri te ao kahuri te tikanga and it basically is just saying that the world is moving all the time and that um therefore we have to change the way that we do things um but i think what i see a lot in our communities is just that over time possibly we've had to wrestle with the balance between both protecting our tikanga and safeguarding our tikanga and the way we do things versus kind of adapting it to suit the modern world so I, I I am really excited about the possibility of thinking about what adapting our tikanga could look like for for the future and and this kind of um, connection between innovation being something that's new and, and innovation being something that's new with a with a K in terms of kind of decolonizing and re-indigenizing the way the way we do things. Um and at at a kind of um I, I looked at this concept as part of my um masters, which was just looking at how we can use tech and innovation in the in the revitalization of our real. And I think in many ways that the real movement is a good kind of example of the the fact that we've had to grapple with this concept of kind of holding and protecting the way that our language was spoken and, and how it was spoken as well as trying to make sure that it, it lives into the modern world and in that way if we if we can think about technology and globalization as being things that are putting our language at risk but if we also harness them and we put Māori at the forefront and and, and equip Māori with the capability to be able to innovate in a way that is going to make sure our deal was protected but it's also thriving into the future then I think that's kind of that's where I see the opportunity is and that's how I think we can harness tech and innovation. Amazing thanks Alice yeah I love um, what you noted around the tech and innovation revitalization of te reo in Māori language and then moving on to John around large language models and how <laughs> what is data sovereignty or data privacy might look like within the big tech space I don't know but what are you seeing as the main kind of challenges or opportunities around design tech and innovation and curious as to why you've shifted away from um, big tech as well if you're able to share. Yeah absolutely uh, open book here uh, some of the Things I, I worry about is uh, monoculture. Um, I, I, from my perspective, I, I worry about definitions of success and uh, from a big tech perspective and, and a, a experience from being on the inside, um, I, I worry about bigger, better, faster, more. And um, a lot of these metrics for success being optimization and massive scale. Uh, when I say that, I, I worry about um, who's truly benefiting and who and what gets left behind in, in these large conversations of uh, large definitions of success around optimization and, and bigger and better solutions. Um, I was rereading this book I read in the past uh, called Small is Beautiful around economics as if people mattered. And E.F. Schumacher kind of talks about this uh, gigantism, industrialism, and what it means to really focus on smaller scale. And I, I just worry, um, talking about like I worry a lot, I, I have these existential questions about tech and innovation and what it means for society. 
Uh, I could give a concrete example. Um, DoorDash became really popular during the pandemic. Uh, food food delivery was really great. Um, but at the same time, um, this also before and during and after the pandemic, um, you're starting to, at Seattle, you're starting to see a lot of restaurants change and start to optimize for uh, food delivery. And so I'm seeing a lot of restaurants that I love um, being takeout only now. And no, they're, it's, you're missing that human experience of being able to go into a restaurant, sit down, and that creates an economy of drivers who are constantly on the go and working so hard to deliver when DoorDash um, optimizes for traffic routes and certain things. And so you're starting to see um, an over-optimization of these delivery routes and restaurants trying to meet that cadence. And so I'll just be honest that I just love being able to walk to a restaurant and being able to go to a mom and pop store and sitting down and just eating food at a slower pace because uh, when work is pretty intense, I get to kind of enjoy food and take a break in life. And so I wonder about things like DoorDash and optimization and speed and efficiency. I wonder about who's getting left behind. And I'm not anti-innovation. I just believe in innovation of, um, with balance and consideration of of everything around the solution in addition to the actual solution. Uh John, that's such an amazing example, that DoorDash example. And it it made me think that maybe that traditional old school design thinking that is grounded in the present, that's where it's lacking at the minute. So I think if you, I think there's, I, I talk about futures a lot, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to augment design only practice with futures thinking. So if we move towards something that looks more like futures centered design, you know, what, what might that look like if you are designing from the future? So for, for example, if you take the DoorDash example, um, you know, traditional design thinking might look at that and say, well, actually people, it looks like they do want their, their meals delivered to home, you know, in, in three minutes flat or whatever it is. But if you're designing from the future and you're asking about what is the future that you want, what is your preferred future? How do you want to pull yourself there and what opportunities might there be to design for that? Maybe there might have been a different outcome. But I think because we're still relying on those traditional models of design thinking that don't always, and some great designers are, I think, taking a really fantastic futures lens. But if you're not doing that, I think you miss the opportunity to design for that preferred future. You're designing grounded in the present, presuming that we will linearly move only incrementally um, into the future so that 10 years time, it's going to look exactly the same. Um, we're going to want exactly the same thing. Um, and design is good for that, I think. But I think it can be better by taking that future's lens. I think DoorDash is a great example of that. Yeah, and just to pull on that thread, I, I think Airbnb is another example where on paper and the origin story of Airbnb makes a ton of sense, you know, uh, staying at a local place and you get to connect with uh, hosts and the city, but then over-optimizing for it then led mm -hmm. to a lot of properties being bought specifically for Airbnb, which then creates a vacuum for people to actually live somewhere. And it's just... Um, I, I just have these big questions around uh, innovation, how people are defining innovation and and what it means at, in a lot and Vic, Victoria, going back to your earlier point about long term and versus short gains. Um, a lot of a lot of questions there. Yeah, love the big question around who and what get let's let gets left behind if we're moving always towards, you know, in the tech and innovation space, bigger, better, faster, and more. I was on a um, webinar call the other evening, other night, not 5 a.m. like Ola, um, probably more like 10 p.m., but it was moving from human-centered design to life-centered design, and they were trying to shift between, 
you know, rather than des- running design thinking or design sprints, how do you move in with nature and um, alongside nature and have design walks or design strolls, which I was like, ah, oh, that's genius. I love that. Um, I don't know how you can sell that into people, but I like the idea of a design walk or a design stroll. Anyway, <laughs> my jump. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just on that, Jade. I was going to say there's a really great um, old school author, I think he's in his 90s now, Don Norman, who talks about um, humanity centered design and talks about the fact that, you know, we're just surrounded by everything artificial at the moment and what that does for our imagination and our way to design different. Um, so yeah, just a just a plug really for a great book and a read on on that humanity centered design, which I think is sort of design adjacent, right? To to life centered design. Mm-hmm. And Don and a few other panelists recently did a podcast um, interview with the Design Better Design mm-hmm. Better podcast, um, talking about that very thing. So mm-hmm. so I will find the link or we'll send it out tomorrow as well. So you cannot multitask at the moment. Anyway, um, final question, and then we're going to um, jump into some learning opportunities. Going to hand over to Jaina, and then we'll end off with open it up to the floor. If you have any thoughts, musings, reflections, questions, please um, pop it in the chat. But uh, and you've already touched on this, Victoria. I don't know whether you want to go first or you want to hand it over to someone else around preferred futures. But what are the possibilities of better futures using the intersection around design, tech, and innovation? whatever that might look like and what are you working on specifically now and in the future? Me? You want me to go? Sure. Um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think the possibility that these, these, for me, I often think about new ways of working or new ways of designing, new ways of featuring. Um, it's, the possibility is that it's going to help us expand our opportunity space, right? So um, if we're using things like design futures to explore um, multiple diverse alternative futures it means that we're we're really pushing the boundaries of what we can imagine and I I feel like that's what we're really missing at the moment um you can open your eyes to these new possibilities and risks that we can then design for and like we've all said at some point on the call we can only design for what we can imagine right um so and I think Mm -hmm. someone said it as well we've designed our way into where we are today intentionally or otherwise um so um, I you know remain pretty optimistic that we'll design our way out of it Um, and that is part and parcel of of a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment to intentionally lean into um, designing networks um, I guess deliberately that that foster and enable us to um, collaborate more more effectively more efficiently more transparently around the work that we're doing to to design and and think about better futures Um, so yeah I'll, I'll keep doing that for as long as um got the, the energy for it which seems to be endless at the moment but um who knows thanks victoria anyone else uh i can go <laughs> um Yay! thanks alex um what are the possibilities um i think i, I mean i really like what you said um Victoria about the kind of lack of imagination thing and I think we used to talk about um, our people as kind of having poverty of opportunity and now we're I think definitely seeing that there's also this like poverty of imagination that's getting in the way so there's a there's another intersection there in terms of how like futures thinking comes into design tech and innovation and and um, just picking up another thing you said John about about innovation and the way you work is kind of about optimization and I guess that's where innovation and, and where I, kind of the field that I exist within is often about it's more about like impact and equity and, and therefore we're innovating for impact and equity rather than um, innovating for optimization so I'm just um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking now about why that where that comes from that that's how we see innovation um, in where I work and in terms of what I'm working on I didn't talk about um Ngaitahu 2050 but I can so Ngaitahu 2050 is a project we're doing um with our iwi that is looking at what the next horizon is going to be for our iwi so it's about kind of setting a new iwi vision um a new um collective aspirations or collective ambitions and 
And part of that is a piece of work that we're doing around looking at what the future could look like in 2050. So using futures thinking to create um, possible future scenarios for our, for our iwi in 2050. Mm. And we have co-designed them alongside of alongside our iwi. So um, with Farno, we used different generation groups, which was a really um, amazing opportunity to see how the way that our kaumatua see the 2050 is possibly um, looking or what their aspirations are for 2050 can differ or there's similarities between our different generational groups. Um, but yeah, that has been a really um, amazing project to work on because I think if, if Victoria, you're going to always talk about um, networks, I'm always going to talk about capability building, but I think um, just seeing that the kind of possibility of being able to, whilst doing this project, build the system, um, a new kind of system of people that um, are using futures thinking um, in the way that they're thinking about our iwi. So that has been amazing. And um, the, the, the idea is that these future scenarios will be um, coming out in September and that our iwi, so we designed them with a core group and then hopefully all 80,000 whānau members will eventually be able to access those scenarios and be able to use them to um, give feedback in terms of how what the, the, the kind of future that they want and also we can then use it to, to have strategic foresight about where we want to go. So that's a cool project that... Um, I've been working on at the moment. I love that, Alice. It's giving me goosebumps, but wonderful goosebumps around <laughs> co-designing possible and preferable futures with your kaumatua, your kuia, your rangatahi, and having an intergenerational lens around that, right, which is amazing and touches on what something you said right at the beginning around, um, I guess, Indigenous knowledge and how we kind of draw on that in a positive and constructive way to co-create co kind of better futures mm. which you're living and breathing that at the moment so thank you um John what about you you're kind of moving away from big tech and if you want to delve into what you're working on specifically would love to hear it uh thanks Jade uh tons of thoughts here uh I think possibilities is is uh definitely where it's at um and I'm just so optimistic I'm, also scared of every the future but um just very very optimistic about everything um in, in terms of possibilities of better futures using design tech and innovation I, I i find being on this call and learning about co-creation and indigenous equality uh from alice and victoria like i this is an example of how design tech and innovation is already coming together for uh each for me to be a sponge, pull in the stories. Um, and as I go on this journey of solving more problems in, in my focus area, uh, allows me to, to have a more diverse set of experiences to, to really um, pull in the inputs so that I can output some solutions. So um, just wanted to comment on uh, this exact moment. Uh, it's, it's already pretty mm -hmm. fascinating to me. Um, some other possibilities I'm I'm really obsessed about um, is the triple bottom line. Um, Patagonia, mm -hmm. the apparel company, is really perfected. No, uh, is good at this in terms of good for people, good for the environment, good for profit. And in terms of how design, tech, and innovation come together, I I wonder what are stronger examples of of true triple bottom line. Um, and I, uh, AI everything, I'm in a <laughs> environment where there's a lot of talk about AI. I think the, they did a analysis of the majority of startups and they're all very focused on AI. Um, I think within the opportunities, I, I wonder how we can really lean into what the human handprint is during this this moment mm -hmm. in tech where things are becoming more optimized, more artificially intelligent. Um, I I wonder uh, 
and it always comes down to this for me what the human experience is and where the humanity is and this ties into why i've shifted from big tech and more focused on uh little kids is is because mm -hmm. I, I care about slowing down and focusing on a on a smaller local scale but just juxtaposed with highly advanced material science and i love that conversation of doing things at a smaller more human level but with extremely advanced tech so maximizing on impact and performance while minimizing uh impact on an environment and and a lot of other very uh concerning things i'm seeing around mental health and and mm -hmm. um victoria and alice thank you for talking about the poverty of imagination so many things that we covered yeah i love that maximizing the impact and performance and minimizing kind of the environmental impact as well and have been talking about the i guess having come from probably the community not-for-profit space the triple bottom line for a while but i don't don't know if I can think of any big tech examples where they put the triple bottom line for front and center um, for a long time. And you mentioned uh, you're optimistic, but also scared. I always say at the moment, you know, this time last year, it was like Web3 was really big. And then it feels like generative AI, you know, every week or every day or every second, there seems to be something new coming through. And I am equally fascinated yet terrified at the same time. So part of bringing this panel together was to help um, highlight, amplify, but also alleviate hopefully some of my concerns and move me into the more optimistic um, space. So, um, yeah, so yes, on that, definitely. I just think that's what you said so important because I think we do see those negative framings of generative AI and technology every day. And I think that wears you down. And I think there needs to be more opportunity to highlight what that preferred future is because we need to be able to pull ourselves toward it we don't want to pull ourselves toward like that dystopic idea of you know what it's going to look like in 50 years time so um and, and thanks for convening it because i think the more that we can talk about these hopeful futures and these preferred futures the more we we have opportunity to design for them mm. yeah, thanks Vic. um yeah, if anyone has any partai, any questions, any reflections or comments, please, now is your opportunity to pop them in the chat. There's some great ones coming through already, but I'm going to hand this over to my um, colleague, Jaina, to talk us through a few learning opportunities, and then we'll come back to the questions. Thank you, Jade, and kia ora, thank you to our wonderful panel. Such a cool discussion. I'm looking forward to getting into those questions, so I won't take up too much of everyone's time. Um, just wanted to quickly say if you love these kind of discussions and you want to have more of them, we have a bunch of upcoming um, events. I'll pop a link in the chat, um, including our September Deep Dive, which is all about storytelling for change, um, an open day, which is to be announced, but coming soon, likely um, in late October, and then our fourth quarter business and technology disruption briefing, all about new tech, generative AI, led by our founder and CEO, Francis Valentine. Um, we also have a range of learning programs that cover all things from leadership, change, technology, education, um, masters, postgraduate certificates, and then short courses and micro credentials. Um, again, all just on our website as well. And finally, um, we offer learning and development solutions through our new L and D lab, formerly known as the Partners Lounge, um, bespoke content learning management systems for corporates, etc. And then the very last thing is just if you have any questions, if you want to know more about us, what we do, dive into these topics a bit more and how you can connect. Um, we've got our wonderful outreach manager, Megs. I'm not sure if she's here, but um, these are uh, uh, and we'll include them. Oh, there she is. Uh, we'll include her details um, in the uh -huh. follow-up session as well. But um, she's your gal. Oh, uh, sorry, this is me juggling multiple screens let's go back to the questions and actually maybe we'll start sharing screen so we can see your lovely faces as well 
Um, there's some wonderful questions here. I might start off with Darcy, and this one's for you, Victoria. In designing futures, do you see the futures not just from a human-centric lens, but also from a sustainability regeneration perspective? Oh, yes, yes. Hard yes to that. Um, I think there's a, there's a really great sort of toolkit that we use when you're doing design futures work. Um, and one of the foundational practices that we use is what we use in, in business environments as well. So you're probably familiar with the STEEP or the PESOL framework. So you make sure that you're looking at um, what the implications might be for society, technology, economics, environment, political. Um, and more and more, we also have STEEP V, which is, is values. So that is where you start to get into things like sustainability, where you can kick that off in, in the environment um, part of that, that process as well. But certainly values should link to what is important you know, to us and making sure that we're scanning for those um, signals and what they, what implications they might have for a future that we would be designing for to learn from. Awesome, thanks, Victoria. Hopefully that answered your question, Darcy. Feel free to pop another one in there or unmute yourself if you'd like. Um, but there's a really good question from Nikki. Around, uh, and this is probably more directed at you, Alice. How might we engage with Tao Māori in our local areas if we're not part of an iwi? Big question. Big question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it it also depends um, what the kind of intention behind the, the engagement is. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of... Um, resources and, and things that you can find. I think we need to be um, aware of how much uh, time we're taking and, and resource we, we ask of our iwi Māori as well and, and just um, be conscious of that and I guess come at it from a, a place of nāko nui and a, and a place of wanting to have an open heart and an open mind but also knowing that you don't want to um, you don't want to kind of just take all take and not give um yeah I, I, it's hard to answer that question when it, it it's a pretty big one and I guess it depends in, in terms of how is it is it a learning thing and and do you want to engage because you want to learn about Te Ao Māori and therefore there's heaps of resources and support services out there to to do so um or is it about engaging actually with um iwi which was a whole different thing and Nikki, I'm really happy to share some of my experience as well. Um, of but you know, we're engaging in more in a place based um area from where I live, out in Hobsonville Point or near Kiritia, where um local Manafinoa there is Te Maki and Ngati Fatua Ki Haipara. Um, and you know, I've been really um fortunate to be able to form a relationship with one of the iwi but not necessarily with the other one just yet we'll keep trying uh and then if you're I know Nikki you're based in Tama Kimikoto there's what 19 21 different iwi across I think like probably doing a bit of homework probably doing a bit of research mm -hmm. and also trying to understand why you're reaching out to engage in the first place as well but we can take this offline and I'm really happy to have a coffee conversation and um, catch up with you as well um, John, this one's for you. There's some wonderful comments around Kekaha, John, Totoko, and echo your concerns around the definition of success, especially in the world of big tech. Um, another one from Carl around loving your emphasis on recalibrating our goals for innovation. This one is a question specifically around mental health. So from Harley, definitely heard of on me, uh, def yeah, definitely heard on mental health. It feels like a weight of collective trauma prevent so many cultures from dreaming and these better futures or even getting through day to day. Um, how can we make sure we bring people along on the journey and ensure that we hear them as we go, they're heard as we go, um, when they may not have the space to reach out and join us? Great question. I don't know. If... Maybe I'll throw it to you first, John, and then if we can open it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm just chewing on the question right now. Um, how can we make sure... Um, not quite sure if I'm understanding the, the question, uh, but I think in relation to, uh, for, I, I saw Carl's question. I, I wanted to answer that one real quick before, um, jumping to Harley's yeah. question. 
Did um, that. I, how important is it trust is trust to our future and how can we grow trust in society, especially in the area of design, tech, and innovation? I, I think um, not to use Patagonia again as an example, but with every piece of apparel that Patagonia sells, at the core level, Patagonia touts sustain sustainability at its core mission value. Um, each product they list breaks down where it's manufactured, the exact factory, what level of audits are used to measure, are, is these, are these down feathers being plucked sustainably? Are, are in, it, the whole supply chain is basically documented. And I think their intentionality plus their mission focus plus the transparency is all documented very, very clearly. And so I think that is one example of getting towards um, trust and and pairing that with actual output that's measurable and provable. Um, I think a lot of companies greenwash and say a lot of promises um, and marketing spins. And I, it makes me question what the intent behind certain uh, companies are. And it makes me question uh, my ability to trust those intentions. But when I see examples of Patagonia doing uh, to that level of depth of transparency, it, it gives me hope. Um, and I think this is specifically very important because the founder, Yvonne Chouinard, in addition to the North Face founder, Doug Tompkins, actually have invested so much money in South America where they're buying up so much land specifically to protect from corporations coming in and buying up that land and using all the natural resources. So there's multiple touch points of reinforcement of value mission and actual output that, that makes me trust in a company like Patagonia and uh, being very self-aware of their impact. Um, I, I hope that answers that question um, and and to kind of think about Harley's question around uh, how can I make sure? I, but how do we be as inclusive as possible and bring people along on the journey when people have limited capacity in their day-to-day -day life, right? Um, I think it's a such a privilege to reimagine the future, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank 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 you for that. That's a fascinating question. Um at at Facebook one of the things I really learned was and I'm I'm guilty of this. Uh here's a problem and then using design methodology would design really big solutions. And I think these massive monolithic solutions are the problem. Um because big monolithic so solutions usually don't get to the heart of the matter. Um, in the sense of uh, a solution for New Zealand might be completely different to a solution in Brazil. And that, that's really important because slowing down and viewing things at a smaller scale allows, allows a solution to be much more tailored and realistic with how it can scale and bring people along the journey. And that's going back to my previous point. This is where I worry about over-optimization, bigger, better, more. Uh, I, I think those are the solutions that don't bring people along on the journey. And uh, when when we're bombarded with so many of these, these like over uh, bigger, better, faster, I, I think people get really fatigued by um, um, the ways things are being approached now. And so uh, I just believe in slowing things down. Um, these mm -hmm. These kind of conversations where I can just, see a person and I can understand the level of humanity that's that's going on here as opposed to um uh be, anyways yeah, I'll pause there mm. let's talk for a while so love that John any other thoughts from Vic or Alice around how might we bring people on the journey and ensure that they are heard and they might not have the space to reach out to join us, I guess, around this design, tech, innovation, better futures space. 
So I can try. Um, but yeah, tell me if I'm I'm gone gone rogue. Um, two ways of working that I find are really helpful when thinking about how to make sure that you get the most people um, having their voices heard um, is taking an approach around portfolios. So a portfolio approach simply means doing lots of different things in a space and testing and learning and sensing and probing um, and going in with an experimentation mindset as well. So um, when you're when you're going anywhere to any groups um, one size doesn't fit all so try multiple ways of learning um, and learn from how you're learning as well so try to time box things as well so if you're um, testing out some sort of design or innovation with a group test it out for I don't know say five weeks what do you learn what do you need to change um, and then how will you implement that in the next round so that portfolio approach to innovation I think is super key um, but also that mindset which most people don't have around experimentation most people when they think about change or newness or, or whatever think that it's this great um, hulking transformation that needs to take place you know so you're, you're either turning a group or a business or whatever upside down um, and I think that's the wrong way and it's just riffing really off what John's saying is that start small you know start small start scrappy um, learn from what you're doing and tweak as you go. Yeah, thank you. There's a great question here from Tamor around, uh, and question for all, and maybe we might need to end off on this question, but there's a really great one from Kenza too. Uh, which one, which one? Ah, I just go in order. Um, how do we d innovate and design for scale with a climate emergency becoming very real? Um, while at the same while at the same time design our way out of the pitfalls of innovation at scale. I feel like that's a very meta, not company meta, but meta question table. <laughs> that's a gnarly question. That's a good one. That's not a low ball. Um, what would I say to that? I you know what I a lot of what I um, how I would answer that actually riffs off the last one around um, portfolio approaches. Again, like don't go big, go small, test and learn as you go. Um, but unsurprisingly, I will also link back to the role that networks play in trying to change and innovate at scale. Um, I think a lot of what holds us back as a population is the fact that we work in silo constantly. Um, and perhaps if we started to work more transparently and share better um, and learn better, things would scale easier. You know, change might happen faster, change might happen better. So um, yeah, that, that again, that portfolio approach and experimentation, but but doing that through networks and sharing through networks, I think is really key to, to making some sort of advancements in, in all of those big gnarly complex spaces. Mm. I can bounce off that potentially. I think, um... That just made me think, Victoria, about like it, it, it still always comes back to trust, doesn't it? Because because those networks are only going to exist as if we kind of have a mindset shift and we start to trust each other. And I think um, I was very pleased to see that the next um, when Jana, you said that the next Academy X um, learning opportunity is a storytelling one, because I think there is something um we need to start talking about things differently and we need to start getting on the same page with our language and and using powerful storytelling to kind of build a movement of people who uh, um, have a shared intent and a shared ambition and, and are all kind of collectively moving towards the same future. Um, I think storytelling has a big part in that. I think um, change narratives and some of the work that's happening um around building capability and in, in narratives for change and using metaphors to describe the way some of these kind of big issues because I think we did a project last year that was looking at um fertility partnership and one of the things that we really found was it was a core issue and it seems really simple is actually the jargon that both that both sides of the partnership were using that the other side didn't understand and therefore we could they couldn't collaborate or have partnership because they weren't speaking the same um, language and, and there was a lot of jargon that was like I guess blocking um, that 
partnership or collaboration to happen. So I think there is something around kind of trying to de-geek the language or de-jargon the language that we're using and, and build stories that everyone can get behind and um, all of us can collectively navigate towards a future that we can all kind of see ourselves within and and be inspired by. Um, so any final thoughts before we yeah just that? just really quick uh i recently learned about i i hope this is an example that i think is a metaphor that could be used in a lot of different ways uh recently i learned when when thread becomes black um it goes through a massive process of heat and dying and a lot of water to to get it to become black but when you look at that process and view it, how the thread comes in, um, if you die at the very beginning, um, you can skip all the heat and um, water and the thread is stronger because you're not making it go through a lot of heat. And so the takeaway for me is really analyzing how things are done, re reconsidering things and looking at things from start to end to see how things can be turned upside down to really innovate at scale. And um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen and we can close off with a bit of a cut here. But any other thoughts or comments, feel free to pop them in the chat. But just want to say nga mihi, um, Mahana and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to our amazing panelists for your words of wisdom. Still resonates with me um, that you said you mentioned something at the beginning, Alice, around designing intentionally. Then we can redesign it. We can reweave a whole new system. Um, Vic, you were talking about how might we democratize the future and um, how you know what can we design? Uh, we can't design what we can't imagine, and how do we shift towards that? Um, understanding that we might be in a bit of an imagination poverty. And I do have another podcast recommendation around that that I can share out um, a, bit, a little bit later. And John, yeah, really important is with tech and innovation and what does innovation, what does success mean to us moving from, you know, bigger, better, faster, but actually reminding us as who and what gets left behind and how do we be as inclusive as possible when we're co-creating these better futures. Um, just want to, yeah, so again, thank you to our speakers. Um, thank you to our incredibly engaged um, attendees, your wonderful reflections, comments, and questions. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Um, and my colleagues behind the scenes as well, um, Jada and Megs, I know that uh, it takes a bit to pull something like this off. So I really appreciate your support in the background. Um, and yeah, let's close off with a kaki because we're a little bit over. Me karikia tato. Ke fakaria te tapu, ke watia ai te ara, ke tureki fakataha ai, ke tureki fakataha ai, homie huye daikie. Thank you. Thanks.